leave the drum kit up and running all the time, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice because in a bigger studio, it makes sense, right? Like a different session comes in, you gotta move the drum set, you gotta tear it down, you gotta make mm -hmm. space. But one thing that I really love about this setup is it's just living there with mics on it. So like, you're like, okay, try to do drums, it's ready. Just go in there and do it. Nice. Which nice. I love. So it's like, some, so a lot of it's things like that, like plug and play, like these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, my name is Steve. Welcome to Syracuse Sound. We are a sound recording studio that specializes in music. Are you a musician first and then a sound engineer? Are you a sound engineer first and then a musician? What's your story? I did start as a musician. Okay. I started learning guitar in middle school in music class and they actually had this program where you could like borrow a guitar, bring it home for like the semester or whatever and I did that and I just started learning in that way and playing around with it at home a lot and I just started digging in more and more and more and I remember actually I came back the next year for some reason, I had the same music class two years back to back in middle school. I came back like shredding, like mm, nice. <laughs> probably annoyed the teacher a bunch. <laughs> this all really started with playing guitar, I guess I would say. And I really got into recording because I had a laptop and I kind of just discovered, oh, it's possible to make music on this and record things on this. And my cousin and I would dig into Logic Pro mm -hmm and just kind of learn, well, it started with GarageBand and then Logic, and but we were just kind of interested in like, oh, I can do this and I can make that and like just kind of messing around with the computer and then it just never stopped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you get like more serious with, with the recording studio or more serious with your playing on the guitar? Which of those kind of superseded the other? To find serious. <laughs> I was building a studio at my parents' basement. Okay. And it wasn't like this necessarily, but it wasn't. It didn't stink either. Like I had a eight-channel interface. We started getting microphones. Had a computer, monitors. There were even even built a little vocal booth. Like, nice. Yeah. So were that, you still in school? Yeah, in high school. In college is when the pro audio and the studio stuff got more serious than mm -hmm. the guitar playing. I ended up getting an internship at Subcat Studios downtown, and then that kind of started like professionally pursuing audio. Because before that, it was just like recording myself, and even more than me, probably like friends of mine, mm -hmm. like, "Hey, come over! Oh, let's let's record this. Let's make that. You sure. know, that sort of thing." And then that, uh, it kind of switched when I got into a commercial space, and was like, "Oh, I got to start like thinking about doing this professionally and charging money and all that stuff." What was the, the caliber of musicians that you were recording? It was a huge spectrum. Sometimes it's as simple as like, oh, my, my son sings in, sings in his seventh grade chorus. We wanted to do a karaoke thing. Like, you know, it's the, oh, and then the other extreme would be like jazz jams. And you got like these crazy musicians in there all jamming together. Or you got... Yeah, there'd be like A-list musicians sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. You know, so it would kind of swing anywhere across that. So how many musicians might you get together at a time? What's the like the biggest kind of session you'd use? I think the biggest one I was ever a part of was like 20 or 21. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. 21 musicians at the same time? There was a live audience, and there was a giant band all playing live with an audience of 20 or so. And... You know, there was like drums, two percussion players, vocals, four backup vocals, nice. key three keyboards, three guitars, like it, like full horn section, like a whole thing. With oh, interview. nice. Okay. <laughs> well, very good. Very yeah. good. We opened Syracuse Sound in October of 2022. Yeah. Just wanted to create a simple, accessible studio space to mm -hmm. get in and get work done. Things have been going great. The calendar's looking great this week. You yeah. know, I think anyone in this business would know that there's it swings up and down. Sure. There's some weeks where you're like, wow, the calendar's looking a little light. And then other weeks you're like, wow, it is slammed. So, yeah. Yeah. But no, things have been looking good.
Yeah. Feast or famine. That's musician. That's Life the music musician. world. <laughs> yeah, you know. Like, it really is. Yeah. It really is. It sounds like a natural development of things from playing your guitar and recording your friends to you getting involved with bigger things until finally here you are. What's next? What's well, on the horizon? Yeah, well, I don't know necessarily, to be honest with you. A lot of this has come from an, a realization of and from a mentality of almost stepping back a little bit. As weird as that sounds, I, th I think it kind of makes sense when you think about it, though, being in like a really large commercial space, like working a ton, to then, okay, like, I wanna, I'm going to do my own thing, but slow down a little bit, maybe be more intentional about which projects I do and which ones maybe I don't do. Because I'm kind of, I've got two kids now, I'm a little bit more of a family man, just trying to find a good balance there. And work on some awesome projects. When you were young and single, I mean, then you could, you had a week you were slammed, you could do it. You could yeah. rise to the occasion. Now you got three other people in your house yeah. that are depending on you to like show up and be part of the family too. Yes. Sure. Oh well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done it, man. Like when I was young and single, I remember when I was first starting, when I was getting real scrappy, like I really wanted projects to do. I remember one time there, the old studio manager back in the day hit me up. He says, hey, I got a booking, but they want from midnight to 7 a.m. And I I was like, oh, I'm a newbie. That's like, a, that's a good slot. Like, that's a good amount of hours. Like, I want to do it. Mm -hmm. So I did do it, but I remember I, I like napped the day before and I went through all of it. But like, all of that to say, I've been there. Like, I've done that. Mm -hmm. I've done the midnight to 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. I remember I did... I cut a project once where we started at 8 p.m. We'd end at 5 a.m. Like I've been there, done that. Can't get away with it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yep, older and wiser. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Was there always something in the back of your mind, like, boy, if I could only, you know, open up my own studio, I do things a little differently? You know what really happened was during the coronavirus lockdown, mm. we couldn't do sessions or meet with anyone and I had a computer at home I was only doing mixing and mastering stuff mm -hmm. out of a spare bedroom at my house and I think I became addicted to the freedom in that I think I just really liked oh I don't have like oh, I don't want to talk bad about my clients because I love <laughs> my clients but I don't have them breathing down my neck while I'm trying to work I can go a little bit slower yeah. and spend the time to really make the product be great and I can do it on my schedule I, th I think I just kind of got addicted to doing that sort of thing I think a lot of people got yeah. used to working at home too yeah no that was a big perk too yeah yeah and sure. it's not that I like hate tracking sessions or something I do like a good recording session but there's just something about sitting down it's you have to be a nerd to like it but like something <laughs> about sitting down for three or four hours with a song and repeat and making it better and better and better yeah. and better yeah. and better. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's true that's true yeah. I don't I don't think I have the patience for it yeah but, uh, <laughs> no you don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah it says the cameraman so we talk a lot about next step musicianship yeah and and you know, thinking that your your musical career is taking one step after another after another, um, even if they're they're baby steps, then you're always learning, you're always developing, and um, and and oftentimes that means we're always stretching out to do new stuff. So, what do you think is next for this place? Do you have any idea? Yeah. Well, I guess I would start. I'd back up maybe a little bit. The next steps that I think I've taken recently that come to mind. Mm -hmm were changes maybe in my workflow and my setup. So I got a set of full range monitors. Because I feel like I had a pair before and I feel like I wasn't hearing everything. Mm. So an upgrade on the monitors so I could actually hear everything and hear it accurately, I would not sleep on that. That was a big next step for me. That and I've been spending a lot of time doing referencing when I mix mm -hmm. and master. And that's been huge because it's really easy to mix something and go, oh yeah, it sounds good. It's like, okay, compared to what? You know what I mean? There are some amazing recordings out there, just industry tracks. You know them. You sing, probably sing them in the car or whatever, what have you. Anyone who's watching, they might. They know what I'm talking about. There's amazing songs out there. And it's like, you really need to compare what you're doing to that mm -hmm. if you want to be on that level. So those, those are some next steps that I can think of that I've taken 
with the mixing and mastering that really have made the product get way better. Mm -hmm. As far as next step musicianship, for me personally, I wouldn't mind being better at keyboard. I should probably practice more. But then I feel like I'm... Keyboard right here. Yeah. You you could practice every day. Practice while I'm running the studio session. There you go. There you go. (laughs) I also think I've been growing a lot, or I need to grow, but I have been growing a lot in leadership. Mm Because I I don't know if we haven't discussed this yet at all in this interview, but I I wear a lot of hats. I'm in leadership at a church and I run a music program. Leading in groups and things like that has been a big like next step for me I guess in different contexts too because not just at the church but in Beautiful Mess it's a non-profit sure. organization that I do music with mm-hmm. with audio your ear gets better and better over time as you go mm-hmm. there are ways to speed it up but there also totally aren't mm-hmm. you know what I mean it's not necessarily yeah. something that just there's a natural development that has to happen yeah with all this stuff yeah, I don't. I, I, I'm not gonna say that I'm there or something. I'm not saying that, but I will say it's just kind of you're always improving. Yeah, kind of thing. It's a lifetime. You know, a lot of the amazing engineers are old guys. You know what I mean? Because they've yeah. just done it a long time. You know, and, is when their hearing starts to go. <laughs> right. Yeah. But so, what's the difference? Maybe there is no difference between um, Syracuse Sound, which is where we are right now. Yeah. And Brown Mix and Master. Yeah, so basically the best way to describe that is the studio is a partnership with me, Mike Tavares, and Ryan Wiggins. We kind of collectively use this space. We book it as we go. And then I do post-production stuff out of my home. Mm -hmm. If you were recording at home, it really depends on what you are working on, but the very, very, very basics that you would probably need is an audio interface, headphones, and a mic. I really think that's probably about as simple as you can get. The headphones you can use for mixing and for tracking, and then the microphone you could record basic live instruments and vocals, and then the rest you could do in the box. It's interesting you bring that up because I don't think sometimes people realize like how hybrid you can get between home recording and studio recording. I feel like the longer I do this, the more I realize that like home record, like good home recording is basically the same. It's just not in a studio if you do it right. People don't often think about the options they have. Like, oh, you could go in the studio and cut like really legit drums, and then you could go home and like plug in your your bass guitar and play bass and like work things. You can kind of do both. I think people sometimes forget that. So yeah, I think a simple home recording setup would be great for most people. I usually try and tell clients you should do that. It's it's so funny because it feels like it's not lucrative to me, but it is in their best interest. Like you should probably have a hybrid thing going on here because it provides some leniency with the budget and with time restraints. Now, when I was starting to record in studios, then um, one of the things I was told was before you get to the studio. Practice, practice, pra- rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Yeah. Get it as good and as perfect as you can. Then go to the studio. Is that still some decent advice? Oh, I think it's great advice. Yeah, I think there's a healthy balance to it too. Like you should, like you should try and have your stuff as figured out as possible, but then be open to a little bit of creativity in the, the time allotted. So, how much do you put yourself into some in somebody who comes here to record? How much do you feel the the that you have the leeway, I guess, to suggest different things. I'm sure you do with the recording process. Do they ever give you uh, uh, the opportunity to say, you know, I think I might change the bridge of that song a little bit, or or I might play a different chord there, or do you really want to do that on the guitar? I mean, oh, like, do they ever give you creative input opportunities like that? So I found the longer I do this, I found that people love that. Maybe not, I don't know if I would go as far as to change chords, but I have before, Mm -hmm. but not all the time. But I think when I first got into this, I thought, oh, like, they just want a button pusher. I think I couldn't have been more wrong. I Mm -hmm. think they absolutely want someone who's willing to give their opinion, especially especially if it's a good one, or Mm -hmm. a good idea. Like, I, I feel like every time I have a good idea, they're like, 
I'm like, hey, I have an idea. Do you want to hear that? Like, please. Like, I would love to hear your idea. You know what I mean? So, yeah, That's that was great. definitely a misconception I think I had at the beginning. So they come into the studio, and they it's not just that they want to get their song down, but they're looking at you. Steve, we want you to produce the best song we have in us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the best analogy I could think of really, like, yeah, I could, I could just button push. And maybe they'd have a four-star experience, you know? But I think when they get pushed, that's when they are usually come out really more happy with the product. And mm -hmm. that's when they get the five stars. They're like, oh, that was awesome. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Vers mm -hmm. Versus if I just sat there and like, okay, wh whatever you want, man. Like, And there is an element of that. Like, customer is always right, right? But people I found want the push. I've had clients, sure. they're like, I'm like, that take was bad. I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, do it again. And they're like, no, please. Like, tell me. I need to know if it is bad. <laughs> like, yeah. you know? And I don't think, you're not helping them by telling, by like saying, oh, that was great. It was great. Right. Like, how just often, like letting everything slide. You how know? often does the, does the person or the group, the artist, how often do they come in and they have their own producer who's going to sit with you in the control room while they're recording who can answer things like that? Or, and how many times does it default to you? So it's happened maybe a handful of times, and in those situations, I do keep my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. That would be that would be a perfect example of when to like, like you know what, like until I know these folks a little better, or they, or I know they really actually might want my opinion, like just like, just just let them do it, mm -hmm. you know, because you don't, like, you definitely don't need two cooks in the kitchen either. Yeah, yeah, you could probably run something by the producer, but but still, if he knows his stuff, I've I've never sure. had a bad experience with a producer in that regard but you gotta maybe not at the beginning of the day mm -hmm. you know, not at the beginning of day one you know like day three you're like have some good ideas like sure like especially if everyone's getting along right but, right but at the very beginning it's like no 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 just i would recommend whatever's the most accessible if you're just getting into this i know band lab online is actually a free daw that's all in a cloud it's probably similar to GarageBand. GarageBand would also be a great first DAW to mess around with. And when you say DAW or DAW, it's a... Digital Audio Workstation. That's what they... It's shorthand for the software that we use to work on songs. It's important for anyone watching this who doesn't know that they, they should know that DAWs don't actually change the sound, really. Like, this, the, maybe the plugins that it come with have an, mm -hmm. obviously have an effect on the sound, but... The sound quality is going to come from the microphone, the preamp, the instrument, the musician, etc. The rooms you're in. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily matter which software you're using. So let's say I have never done this studio thing before, and I'm just coming to your studio for the first time. You know, I'm a guitar player and I sing. What should I bring with me? I mean, um, you obviously have a bit of equipment here. Uh, okay. You even have guitars here. Yeah. What should I bring with me, and and kind of what should I expect? Well, I guess the first thing I would say is I would overbring, like bring anything you think you might need. I mean, you don't have to pack your whole house. I was just gonna say I got an <laughs> SUV. I can stuff that full. No, right? I mean yeah. I mean, if you think you might need an extra cable, bring the extra cable. You know, but I do think. Well, because there is a psychological element to that. Having like you're when you're ready, you're gonna feel more comfortable coming mm -hmm. in. But yeah, I mean, you you said the the scenario was guitar and vo and singing. I mean, just if I, I were showing up to that session, I'd probably bring guitar and a cable, maybe a guitar stand, probably not. But and then honestly I think the most important thing that people can bring to the studio is like calm nerves and a good attitude. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if I'm a let's say I'm a keyboard player or let's say I'm a pianist, right? Then um, I I'm not going to haul my my upright piano into yeah. your studio. Right. So how would I handle that? Well, we I've had really good luck with using MIDI instruments for piano. I've got uh, Native Instruments Complete. Mm -hmm. I've had keyboardists come here and just use the rig here, but then I, I had a keyboardist even last week actually brought a Nord. We hooked it hooked it right up for MIDI and boom. So they can bring something if they want. They don't have to. But yeah, they're sort. Of, I don't think it's sort. Of, it would. 
make sense for someone to bring it up, right? <laughs> for well, probably they not. They could. Probably not. <laughs> you have to tune it when you get here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put the shoe on the other foot now. You're, the, you're the, uh, the sound engineer, and you've got a guy like me coming in for the first time. And, you know, I'm a little bit nervous, and I'm uh, uh, inexperienced at recording in a studio. How would you prepare the studio, prepare yourself for that session? Well, you said you're nervous. I usually like to change the lighting up when people are nervous. I'll usually dim the lights in, in both rooms. Like Does it really help? There. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I found it really helps so people can kind of get in, the, in, in their head in the right way a yeah. little more. Like they're not focused on what's happening around them as much. Um, that would be something that, like it would be it would actually be helpful to know. Oh, they're nervous. Okay, like why don't I kind of set things up a little more like this? Kind of create mm -hmm. some mood lighting. But then, practically speaking, in terms of more like actually doing stuff, I do kind of like to know what we're working on, the style, because I might get some cool ideas. You know, I might have oh, I've I've got other instruments at home. Like sometimes it's nice. To, oh, you're working on that. Oh, I've got this cool thing. I'll bring it. You know what I mean? I'll bring this mm -hmm. with me, or I don't like. My, I have an acoustic guitar that I gig with all the time. I don't keep it here. I have it at my house. You know, so oh, we're doing acoustic. I'll bring the Martin. Like you know what I mean? Like you never know. It might be nice to have it. Like that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice to know what they're working on, so I can be as prepared as possible. Sure. Yeah. So this is a song that recently came out by the Shoals called "Only Getting By." And we recorded this song and another song over the course of one weekend in the spring of 2023. Check it out. Hey Steve, thanks so much for letting us invade your world for a few minutes. So cool to hear your story and to see where the magic happens at Syracuse Sound. We'll be in touch. For those of you who are interested in finding out more about Syracuse Sound or Brown Mix and Master, or to book a recording project, shoot an email to steve at brownmixandmaster.com. You can also get helpful information on Instagram at syracuse.sound or brownmixandmaster. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.